Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Thursday, June 28th, Market Watchers Live Show with your host, Tom Boley and Aaron Swenlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Well, another uh, interesting morning of action today. We've got the Dow Jones Industrial Average currently up 53 points, the uh, S&P 500 up nine, the NASDAQ rallying 31 points with the Russell 2000 still showing a little relative weakness down almost four points today. Ten-year Treasury yield was down earlier, but it is rallying a bit now up two basis points, 2.85%. Volatility index shot back up again near the recent high up uh, in that 19 range, but has backed off that level currently down 1% back to 1774. Technology having a pretty strong day today, rallying off of some oversold uh, levels here the past few days. Uh, financials doing the same, also uh, rallying, doing pretty well today. Healthcare struggling, but it has uh, potentially printed a hammer on its 50-day moving average off of uh, selling the last five days. Energy has been very strong as crude oil prices yesterday broke out to a new closing high uh, since, I think, the latter part of 2014. We hadn't seen crude oil prices close above the 72 level. So a strong uh, recent uh, move in crude oil prices has sent uh, energy moving back up off its recent lows. Um, today, we did get an earnings report from Walgreens, the newest component of the Dow Jones. Uh, talked about this a little bit in my blog this morning, but they beat on their top line, beat on their bottom line. I believe initiated a $10 billion share repurchase agreement. Uh, so they're going to be buying back their stock and they raised their dividend 10% from uh, 40 cents to 44 cents. And for all of that, the stock is down 10%, which is why I don't like to hold stocks into their earnings. Starbucks continues to really be weak here. Over the last seven trading days, the stock has dropped from 57 and change to now down at $48, down almost another 4% today. Starbucks really taking it on the chin lately. And Aaron, it's not because I haven't been there and buying my lattes. I don't know what's going on, but Starbucks <laughs> really under pressure. I was going to ask you if you'd stopped going. No, I missed that one day. And <laughs> I mean, I'm hoping that I didn't create all this uh, shareholder value deterioration because I missed my one latte. Yes. It's, it's been a rough uh, couple of weeks here for Starbucks. <laughs> well, it's going to be a great day today. I can tell already by looking out the window. It's going uh -oh. to be. You must have that great uh, Southern California weather. Oh, yes. It is definitely ready to go. Uh, what, you know, let's get started with the show. I know Dan's here and there's so much to talk about. So, yes, we do have uh, Dan Russo in from Chaken Analytics. Dan, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing well, thanks. Thank you for having me. It's. Uh, uh, not as beautiful here in Philadelphia as it probably is in Southern California, though. A little <laughs> downpour, downpour this morning. I know everybody gets bored because, you know, the weather's always good here. But, you know, sometimes it's not so great. You know. Yeah, I know. Some, you know, sometimes it dips into the 60s. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and we actually will get rain. And, and that's always such a surprise. And nobody knows how to drive when it rains because we don't do it. <laughs> Yeah, that is uh, it is rough living in that Southern California weather. Um, but uh, Dan, I know you you're back. Uh, you were with us just a little while ago, but we've got volatility picking back up again. And I know uh, your presentation today is maybe showing folks how they can deal with some of the increased volatility. Uh, yeah, we're going to focus just uh, kind of on having a process uh, for stock selection, regardless regardless of the headlines and the environment. Well, that would be very timely because we certainly know we've been seeing lots of headlines lately and the market's been reacting pretty negatively and the volatility has been on the rise. So looking forward to your presentation. Stick around with us because uh, Dan will be back with us in about 15 minutes or so. All right. And here is the upcoming schedule. Tomorrow we have Chip Anderson coming in for everything stock charts. At least he's on the schedule to come in. We'll have Tom's July seasonality report so we can get an idea of what we are getting ready to face in July, good, bad, or indifferent. I will be doing the monthly decision point chart review on the following Monday. And then I have a workshop on Tuesday. I'm still trying to decide exactly what I'm going to do it on. So if you want to give me some hints, I'll take those in the chat room. I'll also take them in the survey that you can find beneath the viewer on the Stock Charts TV. And then, uh, yeah, no show for July 4th because there's not going to be anything to talk about. Today's agenda, there's lots to talk about. Dan Russo is here with Combining Fundamentals and Technicals. 10 and 10, our first stock will be Splunk. 
And finally, we'll finish off with drilling down. Uh, I know we switched that to drilling down. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at things. I do, I love that ticker symbol, or not really the symbol, but the name Splunk. I say that all the time, but you know, it sounds like splat or I don't know. It's, I know. It sounds <laughs> like probably something you don't want to own. Uh, but we'll take a look at the charts a little bit later and see uh, if it truly is something you might want to own. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and get started on the uh, treasury yields today. You can see we did uh, move a little bit lower at the open. Uh, that's what I was referring to. Not much, just a bit. And uh, we've bounced back, though. We're now up two basis points, 2.85%. Clearly, we've been in this downtrend over the past couple of uh, weeks. And that's put some pressure, at least initially, it put some pressure on the dollar as the U.S. rates were kind of falling back a little bit uh, faster than, uh, say, Germany's, for instance, for a period of time. So the dollar weakened right at a key resistance area. But the dollar's actually started to move back higher. And they're going to be really interesting. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. But uh, uh, seeing whether or not the dollar makes that breakout, I think, can have a major impact on how you, uh, you know, look at the market and how you uh, address your trading strategies currently. But uh, the 10 year Treasury yield right now is up two basis points, 2.85 percent. We had a couple of economic reports out this morning. The final Q1 GDP came in. It was a little less than expectations uh, with uh, 2 percent uh, being the number. Market was expecting 2.2 percent uh, GDP climb. And that uh, so again, we fell a little bit short. Initial jobless claims was a little higher than expected. Two hundred and twenty seven thousand versus the anticipated two hundred and twenty thousand. And so right now, the, I don't know, I guess maybe the bond market is yawning a little bit, although money has been rotating more towards the defensive uh, treasuries as the market has struggled and volatility has picked up. Not too surprising. I want to talk a little bit about the volatility index before we get into this, because I look at the volatility index. And if you think about it, really, the volatility index is priced based on looking at uh, short term S&P options, just looking out one or two months. Uh, it's calculated based on those premiums. So as the uh, market gets more fearful, anytime you start thinking fear uh, and uh, volatility or a volatile period, the market tends to go lower. That's normally associated with market weakness. Uh, when the market's going higher, everyone gets complacent. Uh, there's really nothing to be fearful about when the market's going higher. So as the volatility index picks up, what the market is telling us that it, is that it's expecting a bigger move, bigger moves in the near term, both to the downside and to the upside. You get a lot more whipsaw action as the volatility index or the VIX is in an uptrend and moving higher. And that's what we've seen here over the past two weeks. I just showed you the treasury yields moving lower with money rotating into the more defensive treasuries. Uh, also, we've seen money rotating into utilities, consumer staples. All of this is telling us that the market's getting more defensive in the near term. Now, when I look at the volatility index, I look at it more from a historical perspective. And when we're in a bull market and we get volatility rising back up into this 18 to 20 area, in the short term, a lot of times during uptrends, that will mark a bottom in the market. And so as a for instance, I've highlighted over the past two, two and a half months, the, the volatility moving up into this 1820 zone. And I want you to look at the green arrows. This is the S&P 500 down below here. But you can see that each time we've gotten the VIX to move up into the upper teens, it's marked fairly significant bottoms with maybe June 25th being the one exception. Just uh, earlier this week, we saw the S&P go lower even after we had the VIX uh, almost touch 20. Uh, but we're back up into that range and the market is trying to turn back around to the upside. But just keep that in mind from a short term perspective, the VIX has been topping in that 18 to 20 range. And when it does, it tends to mark a pretty significant short term bottom in the S&P 500. Now, let's take it a little step further. Now, let's go back over the last three years and let's start talking about intermediate term resistance levels on the VIX. So in other words, if the volatility index doesn't stop at 20 here and we do keep moving higher, from an intermediate term perspective within a bull market, we can see the VIX move up into what I would say maybe is a more significant resistance area around 25 to 35. And what these VIX tops have represented are more significant bottoms in, a, in the longer term or the more intermediate term bull market. 
So as you see, each one of these VIX moves above 25 going back uh, the last three years, there have only been about seven of them. You can see actually eight. I've got marked here. Um, so if we were to break above 20 and make another move up over the last three years, it would be about the ninth time that we've seen the VIX surge into that 25, 30 area. Now, when moving from 20 to, 30, 20 to 25 or 30, you can lose a lot of S&P 500 points in that move. So you do want to be cautious. I've been writing about that recently in my blog. As the VIX rises and starts moving into key areas like the upper teens, and especially if we start moving into the 20s, you want to be careful because the market can lose a lot of points in a hurry. Uh, when we had Arthur Hill on here the other day, he made a great analogy saying, that the market tends to take the stairs on the way up, takes the elevator on the way back down. And that is a uh, uh, very, um, I, I think the point can be really illustrated when you start to look at a volatility index that here starts to move up to 20 back in early 2016. And you can see the S&P starting to break down, but literally over the course of the next couple of weeks, it gets all the way up into the 30s. And you can see how much further the S&P 500 dropped. It dropped about 10% or nearly, actually, I'd say it was probably 10% in the period that the VIX went from 20 into the 30. So we want to be careful and watch the volatility as it moves higher. But notice each time we get up to 25 or above, the, the bottoms that go in don't tend to be short-term bottoms like I was just highlighting on the previous chart, but more intermediate-term bottoms that can be very significant from a trading perspective as you look out maybe weeks into months ahead. So something to keep in mind if the VIX continues to move higher. Now I'm going to step back one more time and let's take a look at the volatility index from a long-term perspective. This is a monthly chart of the VIX. And when you start getting readings above 40 to 50, I know 2008 was the exception. We went all the way up to 90. That was unprecedented. But when you start getting 40 to 50, you start making major bottoms. And so you can see back in 1998, actually we got almost up to 40 back in 1990 during that, uh, um, that wasn't a bear market, but it was a correction. And you can see that that marked a pretty significant bottom there when we got up near 40. But look at these tops as we get up into the 40s to around 50. You can see that they coincide with, for the most part, very significant bottoms. Now, this one didn't work, but it was also in the middle of a bear market. This one didn't work, but it was in a bear market. Normally, when you get a VIX reading up in the 40s during a bull market, that is a very significant bottom that tends to go in. So the low that we made back in January actually was accompanied by a quick spike in the VIX up into the 40s. And that's one of the reasons why I think it was a major bottom that went in. And I'm, I'd be very surprised to see us move back below the uh, earlier lows that we saw in uh, uh, 2018. Could happen. Market can always do whatever it wants. But I do think based on history, when you see fear spike to these unprecedented levels, that's when you want to be thinking a significant bottom is going in. That's when everyone's fearful. Everybody's throwing the kitchen sink in. The baby's going out with the bathwater. And uh, a lot of times the market does tend to put in its bottoms at that point. So just you know, food for thought on how to look at the volatility index from a sentiment perspective. I think as long as that VIX stays contained here, between 18 to 20, I'm thinking of it more in terms of that shorter term um, pullback in the market that will end up moving higher again. Another way, to, another thing to keep in mind too is we're at a fairly significant support area on the S&P 500. So if we begin to lose that support, and I think on a closing basis, it's around 2690. On an intraday basis, more like 2675. If we lose that level with the VIX spiking back above 20, I think we're going to want to be really careful with it. A couple of individual areas of the market that are worth watching. The XLF, which is bouncing today, you can see closed at lows that took out the earlier lows back in February, March, and again uh, in April and May. We took that out, new closing low in 2018 for the XLF yesterday. So we want to see a recovery. We had it earlier, but we're already starting to pull back from that earlier high. Within the financials, We've got the bank index. Banks closed at a new low, 450 yesterday, or maybe just uh, 451, uh, that area. We're bouncing today, but again, so far, I would say that this bounce is pretty weak. Um, till we can get back up and clear the 20-day moving average, I would be really careful with the banks. And I've, I'm a bull 
of the banks longer term. I just think in the short term, you have to be very careful. I still think interest rates go higher, which eventually will pull the banks to the upside. But again, when you're in a higher volatility market and you start seeing price breakdowns, you really need to respect them because we could see the uh, selling accelerate rather quickly. Uh, one stock I wanted to mention, um, in addition to Starbucks, which I'll pull their chart up in just a second, Qualcomm. Qualcomm is actually trying to put in a reversing candle here at the 50-day moving average. And the main reason I mentioned this, and I'll talk about it again tomorrow when I talk about seasonality, but uh, Qualcomm tends to do really well as we head into July. And if we go into the seasonality chart and drag this back over the last 20 years, you'll see that the average gains for Qualcomm in the month of July, almost 5%. And not only 5% in July, but if you look back the first half of the year and add up these average gains, I think you come up to about 5%. But if you add up July through December, you come up with about 22%. Second half of the year tends to be much stronger for Qualcomm than it does uh, you know, during the uh, first half of the year. So if we go back again and take a look at that chart, I think you'll see that uh, Qualcomm possibly off of this 50-day test uh, could be putting in a reversal. Also, you've got some decent gap support that comes in just below 55. If that level is lost, I'd still respect the chart and uh, look for maybe even a possible move down to, to the 48, 49 area to retest the April, May bottom. But Qualcomm uh, is one that I think looks uh, very interesting on this pullback, given, given its historical tendency to move higher in the second half of the year. Starbucks, hate to say it, uh, one of my favorite places. I do all my writing and my blogs at, St at Starbucks. Um, just a good place for me to hang out, get my mental mojo going for the market. But Starbucks really struggling here. Big, big volume to the downside, accompanying this recent breakdown. And we can go back and take a look at a longer chart on Starbucks. But you can see that this weakness here on very, very heavy volume is taking out some pretty significant levels. So Starbucks, while you know maybe it uh, serves its purpose for me writing my blog right now from an investing perspective, I would be really careful with Starbucks. I think it's a great long-term company. It's got a great brand, but still even great companies are subject to technical selling. And that is what we have right now with Starbucks. If I pull up the monthly chart, I think you'll see right now we are threatening a breakdown. Uh, if we, unless we have a big reversal between now and tomorrow, we are going to have a monthly close below the 50 day, excuse me, below the 50 month moving average for the first time since back at the beginning of 2010. That's a long time that we've been in an uptrend where we appear to possibly be breaking down. So Starbucks not looking very good. Uh, one other stock I wanted to mention here, and then we're going to bring Dan in. GMS. Now, this is a small company. You may or may not have ever heard of it. Stock is getting hammered. They missed their revenues. They missed their earnings per share. I want to show you a relative chart because just about everybody we have in here to talk as a guest um, or you know any other featured speakers that we have talk a lot about relative strength and how important it is. When you look at GMS, first of all, the stock topped back in December and has been trending lower for the last several months. You look at their industry group and it's been trending lower since topping back in January. GMS relative to this weak industry group has now broken down the new lows, but it's been declining on a relative basis throughout 2018. Relative to the S&P, we've talked about how the S&P is somewhat weak on a relative basis compared to the small caps, compared to the NASDAQ. Well, GMS can't even keep up with the S&P 500. It's been declining for the past uh, five, six months. And then you can see the industry group relative to the S&P 500 has been declining. So these are the types of stocks you really don't want to be interested in. What we want to see are stocks that have either absolute strength or relative strength that are moving higher from left to right across the chart. And when you look at this, you can see that it's constantly moving lower. So when a company reports earnings and comes out and they miss their revenues and they miss their earnings per share by a wide margin, you shouldn't be shocked based on the price action and the way things have been shaking out here on GMS. So just wanted to point that out. Okay, it is time to bring in Dan Russo from Chaken Analytics. Dan, I know you've had some great presentations for our viewers in the past. Volatility's picking up. What should everyone be doing right now? Uh, no, thank you for having me. I think it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a great time to be here. And um, 
Yeah, I think some of your some of your viewers may know I, I host a show 915 every morning on Stock Charts TV. It's called Power Feed TV, where I kind of think of it as uh, as as our morning call. I spent, uh, you know, prior to taking this role about four months ago at Shaken Analytics, I spent 10 years on an institutional sales and trading desk in the past three years of that time. The last three years of that time, I actually ran our firm's morning call. So I kind of view it as as a morning call, what you need to know from a research perspective uh, to get you going for the day, timely topics, just things that are things that I'm thinking about. So with volatility picking up, with trade tensions, you know, being a front burner issue, uh, something that's important for an, all investors is to kind of have a repeatable process that they can stick with regardless of what's going on in the headlines, you know, kind of try to take the emotion out of it as, as much as possible. And I, I love that you brought up Starbucks because um, Mark Chaikin, uh, who I work with, actually featured Starbucks as a swap idea in his weekly note a couple of weeks ago where he said swap out of Starbucks and into Chipotle. And he had his reasons for that. And we can go through that. I was actually, while you were speaking, scrambling to put a, a, a Starbucks chart into my presentation here because I think it's it's timely and it's, and it's interesting. So uh, that's a little bit of my background. I am a technician at heart. Uh, you can see I'm uh, Chartered Market Technician, that's the CMT here. I'm one of the co-chairs of the New York chapter of the CMT Association. I grade level three exams for, uh, for folks who are, who are trying to get this designation. And with all that being said, um, I do believe in fundamentals. I just don't believe in how they're interpreted. And I think that their interpretation is, it can be too subjective. So I think it's important to combine fundamentals with technicals to kind of give you a, a repeatable process that takes emotion out of the equation. And that's kind of what I want to go through today, just kind of my process for finding good ideas, both on the long side or the short side uh, at the stock level. And, and part of that is, is the model that Mark Chaikin has developed here at Chaikin Analytics that you know I, I've adopted into my process and uh, just kind of wanted to go through that today. So, you know, we like to say that fundamentals drive the market, but emotions drive the market to extreme. So if you combine the two, that's a that's a good opportunity for for profit and finding finding profitable ideas. So everything kind of keys off of our power gauge. It's the uh, Chaikin power gauge. Four main uh, factors, and below, within each of those, there are there are twenty sub factors, five in each bucket. And it's kind of what institutional investors look at when they're analyzing a stock and they rip apart balance sheets and income statements and cash flow statements. And they, they, you know, listen to conference calls with management or they meet with management at, at, conferences that are sponsored by the sell side. And there tends to be a ton of information out there and that you, it's how do you d interpret that information? And that's the part that's subjective. So having this 20 factor quantitative model kind of takes the emotion and subjectivity out of it. So we roll up all the factors and we get what we call a power gauge rating, you know, for a stock. And it goes from, you know, either very bullish to bullish to neutral to bearish or very bearish. And really we want to concentrate our long ideas in the bullish and very bullish stocks. And we want to avoid the bearish or very bearish stocks. Or if you're open to, you know, shorting stocks or buying put options to express a bearish view, you know, your, your bearish and your very bearish stocks within our model are, um, kind of fertile fertile hunting ground for that. So, you know, we're not I'm not sitting here every day and, you know, building, you know, three statement models, you know, income statement driven by balance sheet and cash flow statement. I utilize our 20 factor model to look for the best ideas on the long side and the best ideas on the short side and just kind of can go through it regardless of what's going on in terms of, you know, trade or President Trump's latest tweet. So that's kind of my process. And that's the biggest takeaway that I want everybody to kind of come away from this presentation with. You don't have to adopt my process. It works for me. Uh, just having a process so that, you know, when you turn on CNBC and they're, you know, flashing their markets in turmoil segment that you're not all of a sudden getting scared and, you know, 
going to cash at the absolute bottom when the VIX, to your point, Tom, is you know at 30 or 40, and which typically signals a bottom, and you know you're out there selling stocks because your emotions have taken over. We're trying to get away from that. So you know the power gauge here is kind of the, the other the sub factors that go within each of the main four factors. And what what's interesting is that, like I said, I'm a technician. Mark Chaikin has technical indicators that he's created that you know I'm sure you all use uh, most notably the cheek and money flow indicator but there are, there are others so he's best known as a technician and what's interesting here is you know the technical portion of this model is only 15%, right? The bulk of the model and what drives this rating is right here in the value in the growth sectors. And if you look at these sub factors, these are all fundamental factors that, that get rolled up into this, into this rating. So for somebody who's known around the street and through the industry as a technician, I mean, his model that he built is predominantly is predominantly fundamental. So it's like we said, you know, fundamentals tell you kind of what to buy and why to buy it, and, and technicals tell you when to buy it, and you know, from a risk management standpoint, when to sell it, and also help with help with position sizing. So I just kind of want to walk through a little bit of my process here today. You know, the power gauge gives you this directional edge. It combines the fundamentals and the technicals into the quantitative model. And then we try to figure out the best buy and sell points. We have some some signals that we use to trigger, you know, buy and sell entries, but you know, it doesn't necessarily have to get that granular. And I'm going to kind of walk through it here. But first I'll kind of start with my view. Here's a chart of the SPY. Uh, you can kind of see we've been chopping around obviously since um, since the high back in January and you know really kind of just forming this this triangle pattern my view I think I said it the last time that I was on the show is my view is that we are consolidating within the context of a secular uptrend I do expect that uptrend to resolve uh, I expect this consolidation to resolve and the uptrend to to resume and you can see here this is a proprietary indicator that we use it's um, you know, measures overbought and oversold conditions. It's designed to be more sensitive than an RSI, so that it actually become it becomes overbought and oversold even in a even in choppy sideways trading. And you can see this was uh, as of this morning. We are you know extremely oversold, so kind of lining up Tom with what you were saying with the, with the VIX reading around eighteen tends to mark uh, intermediate term bottoms. If I could, you know kind of combine that VIX with the oversold nature of the market, I think you know we. We could be due for a for a bounce here, but but regardless of that, you know, we take it a step further. We, you know, let's say that the trend is sideways. That's great. Well, let's look at where you want to be investing from a sector standpoint. And we have what's called the power bar. The power bar basically just tells us within each of these sectors how many stocks have a bullish or very bullish rating, how many have a neutral rating, and how many have a bearish or very bearish rating. And what's interesting is, I mean, utilities are at the top of the list. So that's a kind of a flight to safety that we've seen amidst the trade uh, trade concerns, as well as the decline in yields that um, – I've been talking about it on my on my on my morning show for the past couple of weeks. How I'm kind of open to the idea of the 10-year hitting 2.75% uh, and then bouncing from there. Healthcare has been strong for a few months. Energy, with the with the spike in oil, moves into a into a top three slot. Uh, technology has always been one or two until recently. You, can, you know, the the hit that stocks have been taken for the past week and a half has really been. Um, the cyclical winners and the momentum names have been getting hit hard, uh, and that's predominantly the tech space. You can see currently in the XLK, there's only nine bullish or very bullish stocks, and there's also nine bearish or very bearish stocks. A lot of a lot of the bullish names have kind of slipped to uh, to a neutral rating in our model. But uh, what's interesting to me as well is the rotation at the bottom. You know, for the longest time, the bottom three were uh, staples, real estate, and utilities. But you know, materials and industrials have really taken a beating. Uh, and, and turn lower as, as concerns have mounted about trade. So you know that's kind of like we start with this with the uh, at the index level, then we move to the sector level, and then from there we try to look for stocks uh, that are likely to outperform. So we know we want to be looking for ideas uh, in the in the parts of the market that are outperforming the SPY for the long ideas, and then short ideas in the parts of the market that are that are lagging the SPY. And so kind of like, what are we looking for? I'm looking for stocks that have bullish or very bullish power gauge ratings that are, you, you mentioned relative performance before, 
we have a uh, proprietary metric to measure relative strength. So I'm looking for stocks that are outperforming the market and then have strong money flow. The Chaikin money flow indicator is designed to kind of capture what institutional investors are doing. Remember I said I, I spent 10 years covering some of the biggest institutions on the planet, hedge funds, mutual funds, pension funds. You know, Mark, you know, has spent five times that amount of time uh, in the markets and he spent a good chunk of time doing the same thing, you know, uh, providing research to some of the largest institutional investors on earth. And, you know, he developed the money flow indicator uh, to kind of give us a clue as to what institutions are doing. So we want to buy strong stocks that are outperforming the market that the institutional investors are buying. And we can kind of take a look at what that looks like. And E-Trade is a good example. And this chart is, uh, goes back from May, but you know, here you can see, you know, it had a bullish power gauge rating with a strong trend in a strong industry. And, you know, we read the chart here from, from the bottom up, the, the ribbon here at the bottom tells us where the power gauge has been. So you know, we want to buy the stock when it's bullish or very bullish. And then here it's, it's, it's outperforming the market. So when the market is in agreement with the model, that's kind of a powerful signal that that's the type of stock that you want to be in, right? From a, from a strategic standpoint, that's the type of stock that you want to own. Uh, but, but, you can't just kind of go out and blindly buy it. And this is where the technicals come in, right? So from a tactical standpoint, we want to buy this stock you know, when it's oversold and when the institutions are buying it. And you can see just throughout the uptrend, there were these rallies and these oversold pullbacks while money flow remained positive that gave you an opportunity to enter the stock. And we've kind of highlighted them here with these with these signals, these are money flow buy signals, and and time and time again, you had opportunities within an uptrend. You know, you could have very easily looked at E Trade at any point, you know, and said, "Wow, this stock is overbought. It's run a lot. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna look at it." But you know, the fundamentals were strong, the model was strong, and the and the stock was the you know, it gave you opportunities to uh, to get involved within the context of that uptrend, you know, kind of pullbacks to the trend line, oversold conditions while money flow remains strong. That's what we're looking for from a stock selection standpoint. You know, financials have kind of rolled over and ETF, you know, in E-Trade rather has kind of rolled over with it. But, you know, this I thought was a great example of the type of stock that you want to, that, that you want to own. And what's What's interesting to me is, as I've been, you know, getting more comfortable and familiar with uh, with StockCharts.com, is you can, you know, obviously without the power gauge, you can kind of replicate uh, something similar. And I have an example of that here. Here's a here's a one year chart of E Trade that I made that I made in Stock Charts, and you know, I really like your. Uh, your scooter indicator, your your scooter line here that measures the technical strength uh, of a stock, and you can you can kind of see that the scooter was was declining and then as the stock moved higher it's above the 200 day moving average to me i don't know if you've back tested this at all you know tom and aaron but to me i feel like 50 is kind of the line in the sand on the scooter and then you know if you if you drew a trend line here you could see a, you know the trend the downtrend broke to the upside with a break of this 50 level and then the up right as the uptrend was starting in E Trade, and then I overlaid it obviously with the, with the money flow signal, you know, money flow indicator, and you can see that as the uptrend started, you, know, you had some small dips of profit taking where institutions were selling, but we've been predominantly bullish money flow. So that's you know that's kind of interesting to me, and I think it's a good way for you know if you're using if you're using stock charts to to kind of screen screen that those scooter scores for for names that are moving up through the 50 level and you know for potential for potential emerging trends and then you know you can just do the complete opposite uh, on the short side of the equation, you know, we're looking for, for power gauge ratings that are bearish or very bearish that are underperforming the market that have weak money flow. Right. So, you know, and a classic example of that over the past year, um, was Tessero, which I have here, but we'll get back to that in a minute. I want to talk about Starbucks, right? I threw this, um, at the last minute, I threw it into the presentation and you can kind of see what, what we're, what we're talking about. Right. Um, very bearish power gauge rating, weak trend within a strong industry, fine. But you know, it was about two weeks ago that Mark said swap out of Starbucks and into Chipotle. And so you know, right back here, the stock's been going sideways, going sideways. But the power gauge rating here was bearish, and the stock had just started to underperform the market, right? And you, know, you were registering this kind of overbought, overbought condition. 
and, and it was a great opportunity and money flow look at money flow has been kind of weak through most of 2018 right some small blips right Inst this sideways action here institutions have been unloading the stock in that sideways action so this was just a great timely call that mark made in his weekly uh his weekly note that goes out to uh clients on sundays like if you're long Starbucks, get out, get long, get long Chipotle. And, you know, the stock has done, you know, gapped lower a couple of weeks ago and has done nothing but bleed out since. So that's just kind of been a really good call there, but more of a classic example of what we're looking at. Again, similar to E-Trade on the upside, look at Tessero to the downside, right? Just, you know, a, a, a bearish power gauge rating the whole way lagging the market the whole way and then as it's going down you've you've gotten these overbought opportunities to you know either add to or open a short position you know, predominantly bearish money flow the entire way down and the stock's just been in a downtrend it's one you've wanted to avoid so you know just kind of two good examples of implementing the process and there are plenty of examples out there i know mark has presented to this audience and you know he does a great job and he, he can walk through you know hundreds of examples on both the long side of the short side of the market but like the key for me is like you know i go to starbucks a lot too right and when i read his note i'm kind of like well I, I go to starbucks all the time like i should probably own the stock but like that's emotion. That's what we're trying to eliminate. The stock had a had a bearish or a very bearish rating. Institutions were selling it. It was underperforming the market. There was no reason on earth to own Starbucks. And you know, to those that listened to Mark, it was a it was a great it was a great sale. So and now here's Tessero again with that with that scooter, right? Uh, you just kind of blew through the 50 line on the downside and it's been an absolute disaster ever since money flow has been completely bearish just a solid downtrend below a declining 200 day moving average like there's just no reason to touch this stock so the point is have a process that will keep you in winners keep you out of losers regardless of what's going on you know what's going on in the headlines right does does Trade concerns really impact Starbucks to to the degree that it impacts a caterpillar or a deer? No, but like you know, you, you can just you can see the process and how we go through it. So you know, something that we've just rolled out is uh, is a new product called Power Pulse. It's you know, it's not as in depth as the classic Chicken Analytics product is, but basically it it gives you the Chicken Power Gauge. Uh, on, a, on a mobile device, uh, you know, whether it be your phone or your, uh, or your tablet, and you kind of can, you can load it up, you can put your portfolio in there and just track your names based on the power gauge, right, which kind of drives everything we do. So you can see which of your names are very bullish and bullish that you want to hold on to and maybe add to on pullbacks. And you can see which of your names are bearish and very bearish that you want to kind of get out of the portfolio, or if you're short them already, maybe add as they, as they rally counter trend. But basically, Basically, we do all that analysis for you, right? I'm going to work under the assumption that you're not sitting there building building financial statements. We provide the power of our quantitative model to kind of take the emotion out of it. Um, you know, folks who sign up for it, we're offering a special deal uh, to stock charts uh, stock charts no, clients would also receive Mark's weekly market commentary. You know, this is the letter where Mark kind of rolled out. His uh, his idea to get out of Starbucks and into Chipotle, so you know that would have been good to have two weeks ago. So here's some kind of examples of what it looks like on your on your phone. You know, Valero was a very bullish stock, and it, you know, we roll through the model, and you can see here, you know, money flow had, has been had been positive, relative strength had been outperforming the market. On the flip side, Albemarle was a was a bearish name, so it's a really really good product. I mean, when I'm out of the office, it's it's what I'm plugged into all the time to kind of see what's going on in the stocks that I care about. I write a daily letter for uh, Chicken Analytics subscribers. So, you know, and I have to pick a stock of the day. So I'm going through this process constantly looking for ideas on both the long and short side. And obviously I want to keep track of, of what they're doing. So I'm constantly running around and, you know, meeting with meeting with clients or, or talking to industry professionals. So, you know, I'm on this product all day long and, you know, for, for, Stock charts uh, viewers were offering this uh, this product at uh, you know twenty five dollars a month, and I, you know I think it's a, it's a great way to kind of you know utilize our model in conjunction with stock charts. I showed you how you could use the scooter rating, but you know if you have the the power gauge rating, you know you can identify your bullish and very bullish stocks, and then you know dive right into stock charts and look for names that are you know have great scooter scores. There were however whatever your technical process is from there. So that's kind of it. For for me today, I can turn it back over to uh, 
to Tom and Aaron, and I'd love to stick around for uh, for any questions. I'm sure that uh, that you might have some questions on, on process and thoughts and ideas, or just the market in general. Sure, yeah, I got a couple couple questions here. Actually, a couple comments. Uh, first, I want to say on Starbucks, I did a kind of a back of the napkin calculation one time uh, because I've been going to Starbucks for a long, 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 long oh, time. Oh, so have I. I can't even imagine. Yeah, and I've already, you know, I dis- I went through a, a calculation to see if I had put my, f- you know, three, four, five dollars a day instead of a, into a latte into their stock. You probably didn't want to do that calculation. <laughs> <laughs> number number one, uh, of course, I wouldn't have a caffeine problem, uh, and but number two, I probably would be sipping on, you know, some kind of a pina colada or something on an island right now. On an island with your name on it. Exactly. Based on what Starbucks has done over the years. But I agree. The last couple of weeks has been rough. And you brought up the scooter. And that is an exclusive indicator here at Stock Charts. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's great. I love it. I yeah. And I know, you know, you were, you were mentioning above 50. I know that Greg Schnell's done a lot of work and he tends to look, I think, around 70, 75. Okay. At, you know, being the area when, when a stock breaks into that zone, you know that it's outperforming three quarters of its peers at that point. And those are the types of stocks that you want to, you want to own. So, you know, I don't know that I would use it as a buy signal when you see a scooter go from 74 to 76, but it's certainly a signal to say, Hey, you need to take a look at this chart because this is one of the better stocks out there. So I just want to, one of the better stock. Exactly. It's one of the better stocks out there. And like the way I've kind of been using it as I've, you know, been using stock charts a lot more is all right. I've been using 50 just because kind of intuitively, and unfortunately, I don't have a way to back test this. Um, intuitively, 50 is kind of when I just kind of eyeball it. I call it the ocular regression, which is very unscientific. Um, when I see the stocks that are going through 50 that also have bullish or very bullish power gauge ratings in shake and analytics, I'm kind of like, well, these are, these are names that I want to look at as potential long ideas and vice versa as they're going through 50 from from above and you know cutting under the 50 level bearish and very bearish power gains in cheek cheek and analytics um those are names that i want to look at uh you know as potential bearish ideas or short ideas like i said you know put you you write a blog right you know when, when you put your name on something and you put yourself out there you know you kind of want to hold yourself accountable and you want to do a good job and you know for me you know, five days a week, I have to pick a stock, which is very nerve wracking because I'm kind of like, I want to pick winners, right? And I'm just doing everything I can. And I, and my, I feel like my process tilts the odds in my favor to, you know, increase the probability that I'm going to, that I'm going to pick a winner, right? Like the best investors on earth, or, you know, if you look at their hit rates, I say this all the time to, to our clients, you know, the, the George Soros's of the world, the Paul Tudor Jones is the Steve Cohen's. I think you'd be shocked to, to learn that their hit rates in terms, you know, how many of their trades are winners is probably 55 to 60%. You know, but they have a process that keeps them in their trade, that keeps them in winning trades, and gets them out of losing trades. And the, and their their winners, you know, far outperform their losers, and that's why they're so successful. And, and it all comes down to that process. Mm-hmm. Well, I know uh, you know you had mentioned the scooters and and talking about switching out of Starbucks and moving into Chipotle. Uh, just to give uh, our listeners an idea, Chipotle scooter rank right now is ninety five. Starbucks is one point seven. There you go. There. You go. <laughs> exactly yeah. right. And and like you know, like I said, I my process works for me, and I'm sure you know Tom, Aaron, you guys have your process. Maybe your process is as simple as you know screening you know, for high scooters and buying the stocks that have, you know, scooter scores that are over 75, you said, or 90, whatever it is, if that's what works for you, great. That's kind of like the message that I want to, that I want to take home. And, you know, I think it's important as well to, you know, find your edge, you know, for, for me, my directional edge with having to pick a stock every day is combining fundamentals and technicals and, you know, using our program. And, you know, like I said, I mean, I would, I could, I have now found since, you know, doing work with, with stock charts, I found this scooter and I've now added that to my process. I founded it to be additive. So it's unbelievable. Yep. Um, I know, uh, Aaron, you might have a couple of oh, questions. Oh my goodness. Yes. But I did. <laughs> yes, I do. We are. Uh, so- taking, hold on one second. Just mm-hmm. for a second, Aaron. Uh, I just wanted to point out, we do have that, uh, pull up 
for everybody. Um, and so if you haven't responded to that, feel free. Just, uh, you know, uh, I think Mark, or, uh, Dan's uh, presentation was awesome because it does kind of show that I think sometimes it's best to kind of look away from some of the news headlines. So the poll was just asking whether or not these recent trade tension headlines are altering your view of the market. And 61% are saying that they are more bearish now because of these trade tensions. Uh, only 9% saying they're more bullish and 31% no change. So anyhow, I just wanted to point that out. What do you have, yes. Aaron? No problem. So the power gauge, you know, is it supposed to be used for more long positions or intermediate term? I mean, does it go back to, you know, like a, a minute by minute or a day trading setup? It's definitely not a day trading tool. So I'll say that I'll say that up front. Generally speaking, in you know, in back tests and and out of sample, the power gauge uh, does best in the three to six month time frame. So, okay. you, know, you, you know, bullish and very bullish stocks are likely to outperform the market over the next kind of th three to six months. And bearish and very bearish stocks are likely to underperform the market over the next three to six months. So d definitely not a day trading tool. Like, I don't want anybody to come away from this saying, well, I bought this very bullish stock, you know, and, you know, for a flip and it didn't work out. Like, that's not, that's, it's not for that. Okay. okay. And if you think about it, with the model being so heavily skewed to fundamentals, right? Those fundamental factors don't change all that much, right? Because we don't, you only get to update the, the, the pure fundamental factors, the, the balance sheet and income statement portions of the model. You can only update those four times a year, right? When, when companies report, those factors, those factors get updated, right? There's a technical portion that gets updated in real time, and then there's a sentiment portion which factors in analyst revisions and analyst rating changes, right? Those can happen at any time throughout the year, but the the core of the model, the fundamental factors, they're based off of income statement and balance sheet, and that doesn't change, okay? Other than four times a year, right? Right. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Um, do you have the do you do mutual funds or are those included in your power gauge um we're actually working on that we're close to launching power gauge ratings on ETFs which would be great i would love that okay. uh right now i mean i can is it possible for me to take control of the screen absolutely yes, grab it yep go ahead. uh just share screen right mhm mm okay so what i'm going to do is Can you see my screen now? No, I'm not seeing it at this point. Not yet. <laughs> oh, how about now? No. Nope. <laughs> Oop. <clears throat> All right. Hold on one second. We're gonna we're gonna get this. I can pull up a chart if you want me to just to show. How's you. this? And go. There we go. Yep. So here, you know, here, here's our, here's our model. Let's, let's take some, I mean, you want to, you mentioned, you know, it's funny. You mentioned, uh, I, you mentioned XLV before, right? So what's interesting, what we, what we do have is it'd be great to have that, uh, a rating on, on the XLV, but what we do have within, within Chicken analytics is, um, these, these power bars, right? So right up here. So within the XLV, there currently are 19 bullish or very bullish stocks, 40 stocks which are neutral rated, and, and only four stocks which are which are bearish, right? So that's kind of interesting. That kind of tell, and this tends to be forward looking, right? Like this is this is based on the power gauge rating, which is forward looking. So, you know, this kind of tells you that healthcare is a part of the market that's likely to to outperform. Uh, over the next call, call it three to six months, and you know if you look here, you see that you know from we're not you know from a rel relative strength has has been getting better since May, right? Like if you look at the lows here in May, we've slowly been grinding higher. We're not we're, we like we like to get through this you know fifty level, but you know it, it's moving in the right direction. So healthcare has been outperforming the market since May. Uh, and we're and you know the, the ETF is currently is currently oversold, right? And money flow is positive, and these power bars are lining up. So to me, if I'm an ETF trader, XLV looks compelling to me right now. 
Okay. Let's see. Have you done a correlation between the power gauge and price movement? Um, you know, back testing at all? Yes, it has been. We've back tested data back to two two thousand uh, to nineteen ninety nine, mm -hmm. uh, and generally, what we have found is that our very bullish and bullish stocks have out our very bullish stocks and our bullish stocks have outperformed the uh, the Russell three thousand by about 600 points annually and our bearish and very bearish stocks have underperformed by about 500 points basis points annually so five percent to the five or six percent to the upside uh and five six percent to the downside all right that's mostly the questions i i know people were talking about what uh shaken indicators are on stock charts obviously the power gauge is not uh but the chicken oscillator is one and of course the chicken money flow you can get as well yep charts so and other than that that covers it up so let's go ahead and I think we're just going to close it out here, Dan. It was an absolute one, absolutely wonderful presentation. Great, thank you. It was a lot of fun. I hope, uh, hope it was educational. Yeah, it was, and certainly with uh, the volatility picking up in recent days, I think it's always good to get a little reassurance that uh, you know sticking with some of those stronger stocks is really the way to go, and not to be swayed by a lot of the headline news and some of the short-term volatility that we're bound to have from time to time. I mean, uh, 2017 was kind of an anomaly you know, where we never really had much volatility and we just continued going higher and higher. 2018 is proving to be uh, somewhat difficult. Yeah, no, it's definitely, it's definitely interesting. And I would just, you know, kind of say that, you know, obviously the, the power gauge is not available on, on stock charts, but like you could combine, I, this is what I do. I mean, I use when I'm, you know, I use stock charts for my, for my morning show and combine what I'm, what I see there with, with the power gauge. And this is kind of a, this is kind of a good way to do it with this, with this power pulse product, right? Cause you, you'll get the power gauge and, and the, and the four main factors kind of driving it. And then you can take it from there. So if you're, if you're screening scooter, right, high scooter stocks, and then cross reference that with the shaken power gauge via this, via this power pulse product, um, that's a great way to com kind of combine the two and really, really, uh, you know, fine tune your process to increase your chance of picking winners. Awesome. Well, we always enjoy having you on here, uh, Dan. We look forward to having you back soon, my friend. Yes, I think I'm coming back at the end of July. Sounds great. Can't wait Excellent. to uh, see uh, what the market's doing at the end of July and uh, see how you're, uh, you know, adjusting with the conditions. So again, we, uh, I, I preach you can't be dogmatic. You have your process, but and, and stick to it. But you know, you got to. The market will tell you where you need to be. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> Thanks again, my friend. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, Aaron. Yes. All righty. So let's right. uh, move on. I know we got Excellent. the 10 and 10. So. Yes. And we had uh, 42 requests while we were doing the, the show so far today. So I am going to grab, I want to grab it so you can see what sectors we're looking at today. Okay, here we go. All right. So as you can see, I, I always find it interesting to see what sectors everybody requests, because I think it does give you a little bit of an idea of what is healthy and what isn't. For example, materials, there's only one from that sector. Um, financials yesterday, we only had one. Uh, so we've had, it, it's interesting to see healthcare and consumer staples starting to pick up as far as everybody's requests. So with that, uh, though, let's go ahead and start with the first symbol, SPLK. All right, Splunk. Okay, Splunk, uh, you know, I think it's, it looks like a lot of other stocks out there that I think actually looks pretty good, but it is definitely going through a short-term period of selling. So what I'm looking for on not just Splunk, but many stocks right now, is for reversing candles to signal maybe that the selling is over. This stock has been almost straight down over the last six or seven trading days. Uh, we were trading, uh, what was this, back on June uh, 19th or 20th? June 20th, we were probably about at 118 and a half, and now we're at 96 and change. Um, to me, you know, we had a nice uptrend in play, but I think the most recent lows and gap support come in here at about 93 and a half to about 96 and a half. And I know when, you know, the stock's trading at $120, we never really give it much thought. Uh, that we're going to see us drop down to a key level like this. But this is a pretty big area 
when you go back and look at the volume that came in on this gap up above the uh, close on March 1st, which was at uh, 93 and a half. We've gone back down below 95 on a couple of occasions, but we have not taken out that gap support. So I think we're at a pretty key re uh, reward to risk area on Splunk. Um, not saying I'd be jumping in at this point, maybe uh, sticking my toe in the water if I was interested in it, but I'd be most interested if we were to see some sort of a false breakdown, a tail going below the 93 and a half level and recovery. So that's what I'd be looking for as we go forward. All right. The most popular request uh, based on the likes in the chat room is PSCH, which is a uh, healthcare, I believe, small yep. cap healthcare ETF. Yeah, I really like this ETF. This is one of the best areas of the small caps. Uh, healthcare uh, small caps have been doing extremely well. We're finally getting a pullback after we had been moving higher and higher for quite some time. I still like the group. I think that small caps are going to do well, and this has been the best area within the small caps. So I think the pullback is an opportunity. We did get up to about 133 recently, and then today's low was down to 126. So clearly we've had a little bit of a pullback to unwind overbought oscillator um, in terms of the RSI. We were up uh, to about 80. Now we've pulled back almost all the way to 50. And I still think given that uh, the dollar looks to me like it wants to go higher, I'm expecting small caps to do well and money to continue rotating into this pretty bullish area. So for annotating, I would just probably look at that most recent breakout um, and then maybe the gap support level right below. I think that this 124 and a half to 126 area, pretty interesting. You got the 50 day moving average coming up from right underneath. Uh, I like PSCH. All right. Next up is that one and only uh, materials sector request, uh, CC. Shimoas. All right, CC. Uh, well, we're down at a key support area. Uh, if you're, I'm going to actually take this out maybe just a little bit longer and see if this is following an uptrend, which it is not. Uh, so, you know, we topped back in October and here we are in June. Uh, the market obviously had moved up quite a bit since October, and yet this stock is down probably looks like about 15. I don't know, more than that, uh, probably 20%, 22%. So not particularly strong on a relative basis. So that means I want to watch key support. If I was going to trade it, I would only get it at support. And when you pull this up, you can see the support that we had back in August and then again in early February, and we are sitting right on it. So if I was ever going to take a position, it would be here because the reward to risk uh, is solid. I'd be careful, though, if they come up with earnings or something like that, because they are performing weak on a relative basis. So I'd keep my stop tight. OK. Next one up is uh, Micron. MU. Yeah, Micron I had recently and uh, ended up getting stopped out of it, thankfully, <laughs> uh, on the move back down below the 20 day moving average. It's continuing to drift lower. I think the whole area of the semiconductors, although they are getting oversold and we have a positive divergence on the 60 minute chart. So maybe we're nearing a, a, an area where we could see a bottom. I'm looking on the chart on Micron. Unfortunately, I don't see any major support until we get down near that recent low, which was all the way down here at about 45 and a half. We're currently sitting at 5280. I'm not saying we're going to go back down there, but as we get closer to that level, the better I like the reward to risk. So if I was looking at Micron, I think this weakness would probably tempt me to at least start to build a position. But my plan would be to buy it as it continues to weaken with a stop below 45 and a half. OK, let's see. After Micron, let's get Verizon, VZ. Yeah, Verizon definitely is in a uh, pretty good space and it is uh, performing pretty well here in June while the market's been getting hit. Uh, it's a little bit more defensive. Uh, so this kind of this makes sense. I don't like it necessarily as a long-term play. I just think short-term, it's getting more than its fair share of money. You can see the volumes really picked up. I think it's just in a trading range and is just doing well while the market is struggling. I think if the market begins to rebound based on the VIX getting up close to 20, I think you'll see money rotate back away from Verizon and uh, uh, back uh, towards some of the other areas that have been getting hit hard of late. I think in the short term, this is a, a level that I would, or a trading range that I would continue to watch. If we could get some volume and break out above 51 and a half, then I think we got a shot at the 54 level. But I'm thinking we're going to continue to trade in this range from about 45 and a half 
to uh, just above 51 and a half. All right. Um, let's go ahead and look at uh, a bank. Uh, I know they're doing stress tests right now, I think. Um, BNS, Bank of Nova Scotia. All right. Uh, BNS, clearly not a good performer. I'm going to bring this one up in the relative chart. Um, but if you just compare it to the overall index, the index just recently broke down below the earlier lows in 2018 by just a little bit. And we're bouncing. You can see that the breakdown here actually occurred on the last move down in banks. So on a relative basis, when you're looking at the stock versus the bank index, it's one of the worst performers. So it's not an it's not a stock that I would be interested in. Let me uh, annotate and show you the key breakdown, which in my opinion was right there. And when it broke down, you can see the volume really escalated. We did bounce back, but we haven't even gotten close to that 20 day moving average. And we continue to spiral lower here. I know uh, Deutsche Bank's been really weak, ticker symbol DB, but uh, BNS, uh, maybe not that weak, but it's certainly been uh, a poor performer here. So I would avoid it. Okay. Next one up, CVS. Um, talk about, uh, I guess, Amazon picked up PillPack or something like that. And uh, they're uh, thinking CVS might get hurt a little bit by that. Um, CVS, you know, the problem with the, with the stock is that it's in a weak group. And so here's your drug retailers, which just broke down again yesterday. Of course, it didn't help with um, uh, Walgreens breaking down uh, earlier. But you can see the group is under pressure. CVS on a relative basis is doing pretty well. Unfortunately, it's just in a bad group. Um, and when you look at it relative to the S&P, it peaked all the way back in uh, the latter part of 28, or excuse me, 2017. And it's been declining since. So looking at this chart, it's really hard for me to make a case for it. Um, I think we continue to trade, you know, trend lower on an absolute basis. And so until maybe we hit a major support level, which we're not quite there, uh, I would say that the key level on uh, CVS is going to be somewhere down around the 60 level. We got as low as 63 earlier today. I think we could make another push still down towards 60. So I'm not interested in it at this point. All right. Uh, actually, from Consumer Staples again, uh, Procter & Gamble, PG. All right, PG. Might as well keep it on this relative chart here. Mm -hmm. uh, let's annotate. Um, but you can see, again, when we're talking about looking at a stock, you see how uh, overall the price action has been moving lower. Yes, we have started to strengthen, but I would be careful if we lose that 20-day moving average because you've got a stock uh, that's in a group that's been trending lower. The stock relative to its peers had been trending lower, but it is now starting to strengthen. That's a good sign. Relative to the S&P, it's been moving down, starting to strengthen. That's a good sign. And the group itself... Uh, relative to the S&P had been downtrending, even though it is starting to strengthen. I would just be concerned if this June strength uh, starts to falter. So looking at the chart, uh, I would be watching maybe two things. One would be the price support level. Uh, I think that I'm going to say right at about $75. That was a key support there. After gapping down on heavy volume, we really struggled until we broke above, came back down and almost tested that level recently. I would watch 75. I think if we get a close below 75 on Procter & Gamble, I would be careful with it. If I'm in it now, I'm holding it, though. I think it does look good. It's starting to strengthen. Let's see if it continues to strengthen. But given the history over the last several months, I don't want to make excuses for it if it begins to falter. Loses its 20-day moving average. That's the other uh, area that I'd watch. The 20-day along with price support are the two key areas here. All right, let's see, apparel retailer, limited brands, uh, L, L brands, I take that back, LB. Okay, uh, limited brands, another one, this is actually, um, you know, I, I guess you could look at it and say what's starting to strengthen, but look at what the apparel retailers have been doing. Uh, breaking out's been one of the strongest areas of the market, even with the market getting hit in June, it's staying up near the high. And yet throughout most of this year, we had seen L brands continuing to move lower. What does that mean? Well, on a relative basis, this is not one of the better performers. And so you've got these uh, relative strength lines that are moving much, much lower, even though we're in a group that's really strong. So what this tells me is that while the group is strong and I might want to invest in the group, I don't think that it's a stock that I want to own. And if I was in it, um, now that we are starting to see some, some strength, 
I would be watching this 20 day moving average. If this starts to roll over again, I would want to be elsewhere within this space. Okay. Let's see from the technology sector, Turtle Beach Corp. It's an electronic equipment industry member, H E A R, here. Okay, here. Well, here is a, a nice winner. I mean, you've obviously got a group that's been moving lower. Um, in the uh, auto parts, you got uh, Turtle Beach, which has been moving higher. So on a relative basis, the last few months, very strong to the upside. And that is what I want to see. Now, the group itself has, has been weak. So if we ever get strength in the group, then I think we might uh, be um, in much better shape. I think I said auto parts, but that, I thought it said AT. That's uh, AI. Um, but still, we've got a stock that's doing extremely well on a relative basis. I actually like this candle today too right now it's printing a hammer on that 20 day moving average so i think if i was annotating this one the key for me would be um the hammer that's going in right here on that 20 day and you can see throughout the last three months we have not traded below we've not closed below that 20 day moving average and we also tested a an area where we broke out from you can see the volume pick up early in june taking out this double top a little bit of a cup handle breakout, moved up. We've come back down, tested it. I like H-E-A-R. I think this one looks pretty good. All right. And that concludes the 10 and 10. Pretty good job there, Tom. I would have to say we're, we're getting really good at this, moving it by quickly. So here are the today's symbols. Uh, I will have these up in the Market Watchers Live blog uh, chart list, live chart list. Just go to the Market Watchers Live blog and the link is right there at the top. We'll be right back with the final market update after this message. Volatility is back and interest rates are rising. With the markets headed into uncharted waters, ChartCon 2018 is here just in time. See how the experts are protecting themselves and watch live from the comfort of your home or office as they reveal the risk management strategies they use to stay profitable in any market. Plus, you'll get complete video recordings to watch on demand for years to come. Join us at ChartCon 2018, streaming live August 10th and 11th. All right, here we go with the final market update. As you can see, markets moving mostly sideways, uh, opened lower, but are now finally on the positive side, at least for the Dow, S&P 500, NASDAQ. The mid caps, though, and small caps are not quite up in positive territory, but they did take back most of their losses from earlier this morning. The Canadian exchange. We saw a big gap down, but is now consolidating sideways, uh, having a bit of trouble uh, similar to the Russell 2000 that we're looking at for small caps. The treasury yields, 10-year treasury yields are up, currently reading 2.85%. UUP, you know, open lower, moving mostly sideways at this point, uh, only down three cents at 25.11. You can see commodities mostly unchanged, moving sideways. USO, nice uh, move up on the open, but we've been moving sideways mostly since then. But USO up 26 cents to 14.91. Looks like we got almost all the way up to that $15 mark as well for USO. GLD, gold, we're seeing lower on the day, moving mostly sideways. Uh, always interesting to see the dollar and gold travel in the same direction in the same way, given they normally have a, a high reverse correlation. The VIX is mostly unchanged right now, reading right around 18, currently the actual reading 17.88. And that concludes the final market update. So I think we should go ahead and, and get started on drilling down because I know I have quite a few uh, interesting stocks to talk about. So let's go ahead. And uh, yeah, I did want to show the, the VIX though, Tom, you were talking about it earlier in the show and I didn't want to uh, horn in on technical news, but I think you made a great case as to why um, inverting the VIX scale can be helpful because if you use it as a sentiment tool, when people get extraordinarily bearish, like you can see right now, and we start puncturing that lower Bollinger Band on the inverted scale, that means everybody's feeling very bearish, very nervous. And typically you're going to see, you know, a rally pop after that. 
I mean, certainly can continue to see downside movement as we're seeing now, but I would start looking for that little bit of a pop to the upside in the very short term over the next day or two. Um, I use the VIX uh, as a sentiment indicator, but more so in the idea of very short term readings. So I'm, I'm not looking at it in the, the long, long term, but you can see when you get those penetrations below that Bollinger Band, you usually start up on another leg up. Uh, in here, we saw mostly sideways movement, but we did get a pop uh, coming off of that um, penetration of that lower Bollinger Band. So I uh, find that interesting. I did want to just pop that chart in there before I, I do my drilling down part. So I'm going to start um, with the sector summary. And the way you can get to this is, you know, from the member dashboard, I'll just move it back so you can see. We go to the sector summary. Yep, the idea of the segment is we're gonna drill down into a certain industry or that sort of thing. So here's the sector summary. And what I decided to do is look at it in candle glance. And I really found this interesting. So by going in via candle glance, my candle glance includes the PMO. So what I'm looking for are good PMO setups and possibly good um, chart setups if there's chart patterns, et cetera. So when I look at this, the only sectors that have even a remote uh, good look for me would be utilities and energy. I'm preferring energy mainly because we're, we're seeing that PMO just starting to decelerate and turn back up. So we could be getting in on early on a move. And so that's the that's the sector that I want to um, concentrate on. However, what within that sector should I look at? Well, what I decided to do, let me go back here. Okay. So I went into the sector summary. I'm going to go back to that. If I can get there. Okay. Back in here because there's something you can do that's pretty awesome. <laughs> so I picked energy, right? I looked at the sector candle glance and I picked the energy group. So now what I wanna do is look at the different industries in here and try and drill down and find an indus industry group that looks interesting to me. So I think this is useful because now I can use that, uh, you know, hover over the symbol and get a, a just a brief look at what's going on there. So I'm not liking that uh, decline here for coal. I don't think coal looks that great. Renewable energy, possibility, but you could also make a case for a reverse flag. So I'm going to skip that one integrated oil and gas. This one looks pretty good, um, but I can see some downside potential in the fact that it's sort of in the middle of a trading range. So I'm going to pass on that one. Pipelines already on a great move. I mean, if you're a momentum trader, maybe you want to get in and, and continue to ride this one higher, but I would be a little worried about it being overbought. Uh, exploration and production, I thought looked interesting. Uh, was on my thoughts for consideration, um, but it hadn't had the breakout yet. And then when I looked at oil equipment and services, I liked that bottom that we just saw sitting right on top of very important support. You can see the tops from March. You can see the tops um, from the end of 2017. You can see that one mid 2017. This is a great area I would say to get involved here. So now I picked oil equipment and services. And what I decided to do next is to use the scanning workbench and create a scan that'll give me the type of stocks that I wanna look at. And those would be ones, and we were talking about the scooter. I wanna look at uh, the ones that are getting ready. They're on the cusp of doing something great. So I don't necessarily need it to be in the hot zone is what I call it, above 75. I'm gonna include some that are below that. And so when I ran this scan, on the oil equipment services and you can do that figure out your group just go in here pick your group it can be whatever you want it to be and then um, you just add it and it'll add that to your scan language so i think that's a great way to quickly just get in there and drill down into those um, that uh, particularly that particular industry group 
So when I did that, I came up with uh, these stocks and I pulled them up in candle glance because again, I wanna look at my PMO. I wanna see what's going on. Are any of these looking similar to XLE? Are we getting the kind of movements uh, we want? And absolutely, I see a bunch of these that are interesting to me. Uh, this one would not be interesting, right? It's got a PMO, it's starting to turn down. Looks like we even have a sell signal, so I can delete that one. Uh, this one, it's getting in that oversold area, but let's face it, it's still on the momentum is still negative, so I would skip that. Let's see, also momentum negative, skip it. This one moves already in the process of being made. I probably want to get in on something that, that has some more room to run. So I would take that one out. And let's see, I think that was left uh, pretty much all of the ones. I did take this one out because you can see it's very thinly traded. So I don't want to include that. So now that has got me down to, I think I got rid of this one. Yes, I got rid of Frank because he's in the middle of a trading zone, right smack dab in the middle. So I took him out as well. So I was left with these five. And so I figured we could just look very quickly at what these charts look like. And you know, here we are, we've drilled down into the oil equipment and services. So I do, now that I can see this on a big chart, um, AROC, uh, not really uh, particularly interesting. Number one, it's kind of low on the volume side, but look at this, we just got a PMO top below the signal line after moving flat. Um, and you can see we should have, with this rising trend, it looks like a rising trend, right? We have higher lows and higher tops and the PMO didn't do anything, it moved sideways. So this one would certainly not be on my list of in, you know good stocks to look at. So here's the next one. This one is interesting. You know, we always talk about uh, stocks being interesting. Uh, it's sitting right there on that 200 day EMA. We just got the 50 to cross above. But you know, honestly, when I look at this, the PMO is still not giving me the kind of information I want. However, the OPV looks pretty good. You know, you've got some accumulation going on here uh, as, as it uh, started to move its way up. So it's a possibility, but I don't think this is the freshest, nicest uh, setup here. I mean, we're sitting on some support right here, that April top. And I'll go through these very quickly, Tom, because I know you have a few to show us as well. All right, so this one I think looks uh, very interesting. Uh, we already have the bottom on the PMO and it has been rising. Uh, you can see a steady move upward for the OBV and look at the scooters made such a nice move, uh, that pop. Obviously due to a really nice move uh, to the upside yesterday, we are pulling back and that again can make things interesting. And we could be seeing a flag starting to form here. So this one I think would be very interesting for the watch list. You can see the five crossed above that 20 day EMA. 50 is already above the 200, so it's in a bullish configuration. Tidewater, here we go. This one is just about ready to have a PMO crossover. It's already formed the flag, uh, but it is sitting against this area of overhead resistance at $30. So again, this one would be one to watch, but you've got a 50 well below the 200, so you wanna be careful and cautious because that tells you that it's more of a, a it's in a bear market configuration. Tetra Technologies. Now this one, probably of all of them, I like the best. And so I'm gonna annotate it uh, because I do like it best. Let's see if we can get that clear. Okay. So let's go to our support resistance and I will add there. This is a, this is a, um, a low price stock. So again, you always wanna be um, position sizing uh, properly. But here you can see we were in this trading zone for quite some time between this area of support and this area of resistance. And now uh, yesterday it closed above that area and today it's moving up higher with you know confirming this breakout. Uh, the PMO hasn't quite had its uh, buy signal yet. So this one I think has some really great potential here uh, to move all the way up to that $4.80 range. So that could be a really nice ride. And I think you could set your um, stop. Uh, let's see, I can't see the thumbnail quite that well from my um, look, but I would go 
you know, it's, it is a volatile stock, uh, low priced. Uh, I would probably set my stop uh, really no lower than it looks like 440, uh, that area, right at that 20 day EMA. So yeah, at about 430. So you can set that stop right around there, but I would love to see that ride up to the, you know, 475, $5 range. So those were mine. What do you have, Tom? Okay. Uh, well, first, I'm um, going to take a little different approach. Of course, everyone knows I've been following the dollar and that I really do continue to like the small cap stock. So let's take a quick look at the dollar. Uh, this is a chart of the 10-year treasury yield minus the German 10-year uh, treasury yield. We continue to move higher here, even though we have kind of just had a, a short-term tick to the downside. But the overall trend here remains higher. I look for the dollar to make a breakout above the 95 level. Uh, we're up against what I consider to be a pretty significant resistance area right now. But uh, the dollar has done uh, uh, has been performing pretty well and actually closed yesterday at its highest level in uh, in quite some time. And I'll show you that chart in just a second. But the uh, correlation had been negative, which we don't see very often. Normally what happens is the dollar goes in the same direction as the uh, interest rates here in the U.S. relative to foreign um, treasury yields. And I like to compare it versus Germany. Um, and when that happens, when we do get a negative divergence and then the dollar starts to play catch up like it did in 2009 and in 2014, we tend to see the small caps outperform on a very, very um, big basis. And here you can see over the course of the last few months, uh, we have seen this outperformance in small caps. And I think it's going to continue into the end of the year. So that's the first premise when we're drilling down is to try and figure out, okay, if the dollar's rising, that's going to impact my strategy as far as whether or not I want to own small caps or large caps. The next thing, and let's take a look at this dollar because this breakout yesterday, the close above 95, actually at 95, 94, 97, this was the highest close that we have seen since back almost a year ago in July of 2017. So the dollar index is on the verge of what I consider to be a major breakout. So again, looking at the dollar breaking out, if the dollar is truly making this breakout, I expect that we're going to continue to see strength in small caps. Okay. Now let's take a look at uh, the PSCI. This is the Invesco S&P Small Cap Industrials ETF. So why would I consider small cap industrials? Well, we had multiple tops coming across here in the PSCI at about 67. We rose up above 70. And I'm not sure how uh, uh, true that number is right there. But anyway, we were well above 70 and we've come all the way back down to test a key price support level on the PSCI. Uh, and again, that's small cap industrials. The PSCI divided by the XLI, the XLI is the sector ETF for industrials. Um, the PSCI has been wildly outperforming to the upside. And I think a lot of that stems from the fact that the dollar has been so strong. Um, and as you look at just the XLI on an absolute basis, notice industrials are hitting key areas of support. So if industrials potentially bounce, and we've fallen from 76 and change down to 71 in just the last couple of weeks, two, three weeks. So if we begin to bounce in XLI, the dollar breaks out and more money rotates into small cap industrials, that's where I want to be. Now, I mentioned, uh, I forget what segment it was on recently, some of the components of the PSCI. Um, you can get that from Yahoo. I want to go over a couple of those quickly. ASGN is one. Check out ASGN hitting a major support level, potentially putting in a hammer right at support. I think ASGN looks good and is certainly worthy of consideration later in the trading day. Let's see where how it finishes today. Trex is starting to bounce off of price support. I'm still a little concerned about this one, though, because I do have a breakout to the upside in price recently with a lower uh, PPO reading. So that negative divergence tells me maybe we're going to go a little lower. Also, this bounce is coming on some fairly light volume, so we want to be careful with that. KFI, or excuse me, KFY, uh, Corn Ferry, after a huge gap out, this gap up, this was earnings related, very, very heavy volume. We've pulled back. Looks like we might be putting in a hammer. I'd actually become most interested down in the 58, or excuse me, 56 to 58 range because we do have gap support, price support, and the 50-day moving average all coming together. 
but current price down to that area wouldn't be a horrible um, area to be, to be building a position in because KFY does have a recent high up near 68 with its earnings. And I would not be surprised to see this one make a push back to the upside. Uh, the fourth one here, PRLB Proto Labs. This one's been really weak and you can see the volume has picked up here on the selling. But I view the, the recent lows here at 115 and maybe could even argue for about 112 to be really good support to the downside. We did go down and touch 115. We're bouncing off of it. Uh, I think this one looks pretty, uh, pretty solid with it from a reward to risk standpoint, because I wouldn't take a whole lot more risk to the downside. But look at the possible return if it gets back up to 135. And I wanted to show you just one more. Uh, this would be a final one. This is AVAV. Now, we've been talking about all these small industrials that have been pulling back. Look at AVAV with the market struggling, with industrial struggling, and even small caps pulling back. The volume has been picking up on AVAV as we get a breakout. I think that uh, is a pretty good signal of solid relative strength. So those were the five that I had, five individual stocks. I know uh, Aaron went through a different approach, taking a look at some of the energy stocks. So those are our um, yes. rolling down stocks for the session. Yeah, uh, energy has just been um, shining on my PMO scans for the last week or so. They keep popping up uh, in great numbers. So I don't know if we're now overbought at this point. Uh, I'm, I'm not looking at it that way. I really am not. We're not overbought as far as PMOs. So Yeah, I mean, I think there are definitely areas of the market. Per personally, I'm bullish. I am, I'm always concerned when the VIX is on the rise, and we have seen that VIX move up into that uh, 1820 territory, and anytime it gets there, you want to certainly be cautious, especially if it breaks above, because as I showed earlier in the show, if you start talking about a 25, 30, 35 VIX, uh, the prices that we're sitting out right now in the S&P 500 probably look really good another few days from now if the VIX does break out to the upside, so I'd watch that. But if the VIX gets capped at 20 and starts to roll back over again, I think the market's ready to move. And I think some of these areas that have been so oversold, like the industrials, could make a move. And I look for small caps to uh, help drive that to the upside. Absolutely. Uh, somebody, let me see if I can find it. Now, somebody had asked uh, the Warren Buffett question, you know, is it uh, good to be greedy when uh, everybody is fearful? And my particular answer was, I don't think being greedy is ever a good thing because that means you're not being disciplined. Yeah, I don't know in what context the greedy was mentioned, but I, I kind of understand the, uh, you know, the comment because when everyone else is fearful is when you really should be buying, when everyone else is greedy is when you really should be thinking about selling in terms of sentiment. And I think you've pointed that out a lot with sentiment in your uh, discussions each week. Um, so I would just say, yeah, when the volatility index is on the rise, uh, that's when I'm usually licking my chops, looking for a reversal, especially from a short-term trading perspective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Another great show. Here's Another our upcoming day. schedule. Yep. It was great having uh, Dan Russo on today as well. A very energetic uh, guest. Uh, you can see very passionate about what he does. So it was great having Dan on the show as well. Yes. And if you guys have ideas for me for my workshop, uh, I would love to hear those. Just uh, go to the survey that's right under the viewer here on Stock Charts TV and let me know what you'd like to hear about. All right. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being with us today. As Erin just mentioned, uh, fill out that uh, survey if you don't mind as you exit. Give her some ideas for her uh, topic, uh, for her workshop coming up, and also uh, give some feedback. Let us know what you thought of Dan's presentation. I thought it was awesome. Uh, as a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Thursday afternoon, everybody. We'll be back here tomorrow on Friday. Happy trading. Volatility is back and interest rates are rising. With the markets headed into uncharted waters, ChartCon 2018 is here just in time. 
See how the experts are protecting themselves and watch live from the comfort of your home or office as they reveal the risk management strategies they use to stay profitable in any market. Plus, you'll get complete video recordings to watch on demand for years to come. Join us at ChartCon 2018, streaming live August 10th and 11th.